Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Einar Nilsson Nygaard. I'm a principal engineer for Cisco. I work on device programmability and automation across multiple Cisco operating systems. I'm here to talk to you today about, well, it was going to be Cisco's next-gen device-level APIs, but things have kind of changed over the last year since I last gave this presentation. Now it's pretty much, this is what we have today. So what I'm going to talk to you about is what we have today, why we need it, and give you guys a few pointers to what you can do with it, where you can find out more details. So we're going to talk about why network programmability or why network automation really matters today. Talk about why we need data models to help us solve some of those problems. Talk about what the industry is doing, what Cisco in particular is doing in this area. And then, as I said, give you guys some pointers to online communities, tooling you can use within your own organization to get to grips with data models. So today, if you look at any of the vendors like Cisco, Juniper, Brocade, we've got about 20, 30 years of development behind us. We've got a lot of data in our platforms, a lot of different manageability interfaces, a lot of different interfaces that are really put in place to deal with human to machine interactions because everybody knows you know you do the cli you get full functionality from cisco platforms from other vendors this doesn't really scale as we try to move forward and try to make network management more effective efficient today the cost of the hardware you buy from a vendor like cisco is really outweighed by the long-term cost of operating it um, this number, 33% to 67%, it probably hasn't changed all that much recently. It's still pretty much a valid figure to, to consider moving forward. Perhaps more importantly, the amount of time it takes you to configure your network compared to configuring, say, a server in your network, there's a huge imbalance there still. There's been improvements over the last few years, but we're still in a, a very bad place when it comes to how long it takes you to get your network up and running and configured for operations. When we look at the plethora of software we have coming out these days, these guys, probably some of you are using some of these tools in your organizations, I would guess. These guys are going to have problems scaling moving forward if you have to use CLI-based interfaces, if they have to use SNMP. So we really need to do better for all of these tool vendors, ISVs, give them better interfaces into the network. About 14 years ago now, the industry came together and started defining the requirements of what they think thought of as next-gen config management. They like to talk about ease of use. They like to talk about the separation of config and operational data. They, want, they wanted to emphasize availability of tooling for customers and for software vendors to get to grips with data models, to get to grips with configuring the network. <clears throat> the formats they wanted to use to talk to the network needed to be accessible um, and have yeah, have lots of tooling available to them, provide error checking capabilities so that network interactions can be more deterministic in nature. Today, when you're going through the CLI of Cisco platforms, it's not always obvious to a machine what's actually happened, did the configuration actually take, and it becomes very trouble, very, lots of trouble in terms of interpreting the responses of the devices. The final point, human and machine friendly, this was important back when we were doing the next-gen config requirements, but more and more it's becoming obvious that really what's most important is having machine-friendly interfaces. Because today, the situation we're in, it's not all that good. So today, we have various interfaces into network. We've got SNMP, we've got Syslog, we've got CLI, as well as some of the data model stuff that's coming along, but the data model stuff is far outweighed by all of these interfaces. What do these guys force you to do? They force you to introduce software, to do SMP polling to collect your data, to field syslog messages over UDP, a bunch of scripts in order to screen scrape from various different platforms, different vendors, including Cisco. <clears throat> and there's a bunch of problems with these things. So the SNMP interfaces tend to be incomplete in terms of configuration management. They're really only useful for monitoring your network, not really useful for configuring your network in general. SNMP also presents scale problems when you have large scale networks or if you're moving towards IoT scale networks. These guys, they're doing a pool of data, they can't scale to, to uh, cater for the networks as, as they move forward. Syslogs, again, they're incomplete. 
They're also unstructured data. This is really not good in terms of the amount of time and investment you have to put into understanding the data coming from the network as an ISV or as a customer. When we look at scripts, uh, scripts are again, they're unstructured. You have to parse data that was really intended for humans to read. Humans are good at pattern matching. Machines have to be taught how to pattern match, right? They don't do it automatically. And also, certainly my personal experience, CLI is subject to change. And that quite often forms a, a large part of the problems our customers have to deal with. So what do data models give us um, in contrast to that? As we move forward, uh, when we adopt data models, the devices that we will sell, they become more self-describing. This includes the description of the constraints that you can apply to configuration going onto the box. This allows you to easily implement validation off the box and construct configurations that are valid as far as the box is concerned, something that's very troublesome if you're trying to do configuration via CLI today. Data models let us build very comprehensive tool chains, let us build up the automation capabilities of the, inter of the, of the network management systems. It becomes a lot simpler to generate API language bindings. We have examples today of people who have generated uh, Python, Ruby, Java, or C code from Yang data models, for example. And it becomes easier to set up, I guess we call data transformation pipelines, because not everybody needs to use an API, but people do need a way to construct the path for, say, configuration data coming in through an order management system through to the device itself. The separation of models from protocols and encodings means it's easier for vendors to add new transports, new protocols, new encodings into our devices. Today, Cisco, as an example, has started with NetConf and RESTConf in some of our devices, but we've used the same infrastructure, the same model-based infrastructure to move forward and support, for example, gRPC. When we take all this stuff together, uh, these characteristics begin to help us across all of the high-level use cases that customers have today. We can look at configuration and provisioning, where operations become a lot more deterministic, both in terms of pushing data onto the devices and pulling the configuration back from the devices. We can look at the description of operational data to support ad hoc querying of the, of the, of the state of the network to verify the condition of an interface, to verify that a routing policy is actually filtering the correct routes through the network. And we can look at telemetry, where the self-describing nature of the boxes allows you to register for structured data that will be fed to you a, on a regular basis. And we're also moving towards what we call event-based telemetry, again, described by data models to let you get more, more fine-grained notifications of changes. So one of the key use cases enabled by event-based telemetry could be, for example, tracking the condition of the rib on your box, being notified of changes to that device, or we could look at the tracking of security parameters on an interface, the contents of an ACL, whether an ACL is bound to an interface. Telemetry, the structured data def dis dis definition, gives you access to all of that information in a much more useful way and a much more timely fashion. So let's talk a bit about the data models themselves. Uh, there's really kind of three, three classifications I'll talk about here, uh, starting with what's best for the industry. We've got open industry standards coming from organizations such as ITF, ITU, uh, customer groups like OpenConfig. These are models which are vendor neutral in nature, which are going to be supported across a broad range of, of vendor platforms. Uh, we work across vendors in terms of defining these models and trying to make sure they're fit for purpose. The Open Config Group, I'll talk about them in a, in a little while. They're much more focused on operator requirements rather than taking it from the vendor perspective. And that gives a different spin in the models in terms of how they're constructed and what kind of features they cover. When we move forward and, and look at, you know, it's a reality that each individual vendor has features in their platform that are peculiar to that vendor. So just like SNMP provided for augmentation of SNMP MIBs, Data models provide for augmentation of the standard models to bring in, for example, cross-platform BGP extensions that maybe Cisco supports on XR and XE. And these models will be presented within the context of the industry standard model. So giving you the kind of the, the single frame of reference to let you work with 
a common set of data models, but still access vendor-specific functionality you may depend on within your network. Finally, every vendor, Cisco for sure, uh, we, we have specific models to our platforms that are based around our internal implementation. These tend to be um, specific to each individual operating system. And this is kind of like the fallback. This is where you get the maximal functionality. Uh, but you pay the penalty of not having off-box code that can work across multiple platforms from a vendor or across multiple vendors. So Cisco is trying to drive how we look at modeling over towards this side, try to make it easier for customers to actually have common software running off the box, not having to deal deal with the differences that we see down at this end. And essentially reduce the friction for you guys in terms of deploying your networks, managing them, getting operational data out. So we look at the open industry standards. Um, the IETF first, they have a range of basic models uh, which they've standardized so far. We can think about interface management, basic notifications, IP address management, overall system management, syslog models, all this kind of stuff. All these things are there today. And there's a whole bunch of things in and around inventory management, ACLs, routing protocols, VPN management, L2 VPN management, MPLS. All these things are under development. You can find documentation or the actual model definitions themselves in GitHub these days. We've tried to make this information, as industry, we're trying to make this information available to developers in a very friendly way so that it's very easy for you to get hold of the data models and integrate them into your development processes. Uh, the IETF models in particular are classified into RFCs, which are the standardized models, and into drafts, which are the models which are under development by various members of the IETF. The IEEE and the Metro Ethernet Forum are all also spinning up various modeling initiatives. They're looking at maybe 802.3 management, 802.1 management, and providing data models to fill in some of the gaps that the IETF wouldn't naturally fill in. Open config. Um, again, it's a customer-driven forum. They have a range of basic models. Uh, again, looking at interface management, all the technologies around that. Um, they also have a broader focus on things like routing protocols and telemetry. They've moved forward faster than the IETF has. And again, all these models are available on their GitHub website, open config, public. And you can find all the different kind of um, domains that they are defining models for. Finally, we do have a whole bunch of vendor-specific models which are being published by a variety of the vendors. So Brocade, Sienna, Cisco, Juniper, Humorworks, we all publish our, our, sort of our native models, if you like, in the same place in GitHub um, alongside the IETF models. And so we coordinate across the vendors to make these models available to you guys. Uh, for use. So we can talk a little bit about Cisco in this context. So each vendor has their own kind of space where we publish models. If we look at iOS XR, we started publishing models here a couple of years ago now. Um, and as we've progressed through various iOS XR releases, we've broadened out the coverage of our native models to give more and more access to the functionality on our platforms. Uh, this is already out of date. We just published our 613 models uh, this morning. So we're tracking uh, as, as fast as we can the evolving releases of our platforms moving forward. We can also see that we've started to publish models as of iOS XE 16.3.1, uh, publishing primarily native models with some IETF model support, and then moving through to the more recent 16.4.1 release, where we've again got more native model coverage and more open model coverage. Nexus isn't being left behind. Uh, Nexus has got its own set of native models as well. And they are following along uh, with the overall kind of approach of producing open model models as well. Uh, they have started following, um, following the open config models. So how do we do this in our platforms today? We've got a generalized software architecture for uh, supporting both native and open data models in the platforms. Developers can use and we advise they use the open models where they're available. Uh, but we always have the fallback of the platform native models in case you need to get full access to all the functionality. Each of our platforms now has an integrated mapping layer, which allows us to transform from the open models to the native models and make sure that when we're down here, 
in the configuration piece of the system, of the network device, we only store one representation of the configuration. So there's no kind of, these models do not get out of sync, out of sync with these models. You're managing one consistent config and operational data store. We have a bunch of communities uh, which have been put together by the industry, by particular vendors as well. Um, anybody here a member of the Network to Code Slack community? No? Yeah? <laughs> There's a lot of interesting dialogue there across vendors um, within specific open source technologies. A lot of good discussions happen. Um, it's something that's very worthwhile following up on. We have the Open Config group. Uh, open Config, just to expand a little bit on what they are, they're a group of industry operators or industry yeah, operators, people like Google, AT&T, Verizon, Facebook, Comcast, uh, some European customers as well. Cisco's European customers are members of Open Config. And they take an approach to modeling where they welcome people who, who have to operate networks. So they, they pretty much keep vendors at arm's length and focus on what do, what are the people that run the networks, what do they need from data models, what coverage do they require, how should those models be structured. So any customer who is interested in joining Open Config is very welcome to go along to the Open Config website, join those guys, and start to kind of influence the direction of the Open Config models within the industry. They have a, a group where they discuss things publicly, um, but they welcome direct engagement for sure. Cisco has a bunch of stuff we do. We call it open device programmability. It's supported by the developer.cisco.com website, um, ODP. And within that, we also have the DNA community uh, for people who are interested in the broader sweep of products around data models and automation, including DNA, DNA center, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of support there you can find in terms of sample code, reference guides, and discussion forums for assistance with various Cisco products in the area of automation and programmability. One of the initiatives we've kicked off about a year, year and a half ago is what we call the Yang Development Kit. The Yang Development Kit is a, a set of tools that we've put together to allow, um, allow developers to take Yang data models and generate, for now, Python-based APIs. Uh, but we're also looking at releasing a toolkit or a version of the toolkit that that delivers C++ APIs, and we've got interest from other people in extending these tools and taking it forward to cover languages such as Go. Um, the YDK is an open source initiative. We also provide prepackaged libraries generated by the YDK, but you can also pull down the libraries, generate your own uh, APIs from your own data models or from other vendors' data models. We've taken a very um, Yang-centric approach to this. It's nothing that's tied to particular Cisco devices works with any, anybody that supports Yang native interfaces. We can also look at some of the schema tools <coughs> which the industry has released mainly under open source. These tools are really there to support people who want to understand models, understand the structure, uh, process them themselves, maybe generate diagrammatic representations of data models or do their own processing of those data models. You can pull out, you know, as we said earlier on, Yang data models describe not just the data, but also the constraints on the data. So the tools that you can build on top of things like PyYang allow you to do your own validation, um, to manipulate data models in the way that fits your scenarios. We can also look at tools like GoYang, which is something that Google released um, a couple of years ago, which is it's a kind of a parallel effort to PyYang, but more focused around a kind of a gRPC, GPB, Go-based ecosystem, uh, which is something which is gaining quite a bit of popularity within the DevOps community today. One of our customers, AT&T, also released a thing called the Yang Design Studio as an open source tool set based on Eclipse to allow anybody to start authoring Yang data models and starting to build up their expertise in this area. So we talked about the YDK already. There's a couple of links in here for you guys to find it. Um, as I said, it's open source. It does Python today, C++ quite soon. 
It only interacts with devices over NetConf today, but we're also looking at introducing RESTConf support. I think if any of you were at some of the workbench sessions, you might have talked to one of my colleagues, Ralph, about NetConf and RESTConf. Um, RESTConf is coming. Payang Bind is another open source initiative based around generating a slightly different flavor of Python code from Yang data models. The JNC, Java NetConf client, is an open source Java-based client to allow you to use NetConf with any compliant device. They also have some code generation capabilities in there from the Yang data models to allow you to generate a kind of a more type-safe binding onto NetConf objects. And the Open Daylight controller has what they call Yang Tools, another open source initiative where they also produce Java code from Yang data models. There's also a bunch of lower level libraries you can use. Uh, NC Client is the kind of the, the de facto Python standard for using NetConf. It's now really quite stable. It's gone through several iterations over the last few years. Um, it's very easy to install and get to grips with. And it's something that we actually use as part of our YDK initiative. So it's, it's integral to that as well. And it's been used by multiple vendors who are starting to look at integrating with NetConf capabilities and network. You'll find it used under the covers by tools such as Ansible, Puppet, Chef, where they're interacting with devices that um, support NetConf interfaces. If you want to go the C route, uh, you can look at libnetconf. It's released by an uh, academic institution in Eastern Europe. I forget which country. Uh, the Cesnet guys have got libnetconf, and then they've got some other tools, which we'll talk about in a moment, built in that. And again, we've got the JNC, which is really just, this is just talking to the, the pure netconf protocol aspect of it. So I talked about the Cesnet guys. They've also released a very interesting tool. You can download this as a, as a, a VM and probably also as a Docker container called NetoPeer. It's like an open source NetConf-based element manager. It lets you manage, certainly today, small networks of NetConf devices and leverage the capabilities they expose. Cisco also has ConfD Basic, which is a freemium product that we, we give to anybody that wants to get their toes wet in terms of working with NetConf Yang to build their own agents, if that's something that you're interested in doing. You can look at MGSoft as a commercial product. They really help you visualize and design Yang data models. Um, we also see Yang kind of, and data models in general, branching out into other areas. So this thing, Yang Forge, it's, it's a tool for letting Node.js developers build applications and services defined by Yang data models. So what we can see here is that the idea of using these data models is broadening out beyond purely being a device level interface, but is now actually going into the application space as well. Finally, uh, I'd just like to mention Yang Explorer. Uh, it's an open source thing that Cisco released again a couple of years ago. It's a Django-based web app that lets you load in Yang data models and visualize them. It'll also let you generate sample payloads for devices and send and receive data over NetConf and RESTConf today. So pretty much in conclusion, um, right now, there's a whole bunch of momentum building behind data models for device and the network layers. We are seeing both vendors and operators unifying behind Yang data models. Um, as the way of expressing the capabilities of the network, as the way of expressing constraints, defining the operational data. We're now seeing that there's a broad availability of Yang data models at the device layer. This is now real. Two years ago, that wasn't the case. We had very spotty coverage. But now you can take an iOS XR device, for example, and you can have a really a, a broadly a good experience, both in terms of config management and operational state. Over the last two years, we've also really seen a growth in the overall community around network programmability and automation. Uh, there's an awful lot of investment in the tooling today, and these things are becoming more available to customers, to other developers, and it's making it easier for users to transition towards using data models. As an industry, we do realize that an awful lot of where customers are today is CLI-based management. Um, when you're at the device layer. So we're looking at building tools that can help people transition from one to the other, 
how do you go from your iOS XE configuration into something you can apply over NetConf or RESTConf? Those tools you'll begin to find coming out on sites like the, the ODP websites in Cisco and being released as open source tools on GitHub. That's pretty much all I had for you guys. I think I've got time for questions. If anybody has any questions, comments. <laughs> no? OK, thank you very much. For, thank you for your time. <laughs> if you do have any comments, there's a Spark room you can register for in the session. And if you get any comments, questions, whatever, it's going to be there for a couple of weeks. Feel free, I'm in that Spark room. If you have any questions, I can find answers for you, put you in contact with anybody that can better help you. Um, so just put in your email address and join. Thanks very much.